Today, September 23, 2008, we are interviewing Morris Katz in Albany, New York. He served in the United States Air Force from August 1940 through July 1945. This interview is being conducted by Kenneth and June Hunter at 11.30 a.m. Please tell us your full name and when and where you were born. Uh, my name is Morris Katz. I was born in New York City, but I was raised in a small town about 30 miles out of New York City, Ossining, New York. Now, what did you do before you entered the Air Force? Really, I was about one year or less out of high school. I felt I had nothing that I could do that I was prepared for, and realizing in that year, 1938, that the war was going to come at some point to our shores, I volunteered into the, into the U.S. Army Air Corps. At that time, it was the Air Corps. So then you volunteered, mm -hmm. and then where did you go for basic training? Well, I originally wanted my basic training out in Hawaii, but I guess fortunately for me, they had no room for me out there, so they <laughs> sent me to Mitchell Field, okay. New York at Long Island. And do you remember anything about the basic training, what you did? Yes, we, we uh, we sort of marched around a lot, did the um, sort of rear uh, march and you know all that stuff you see on television. And um, the thing I remember most about, we lived in a hangar that had no heat in it, and the fall came up on us, and we had to wash outside in cold water from the cold water taps and just troughs that were sitting out there. Very difficult to shave. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the way, I, uh, I was uh, in one of the base squadrons when I was assigned, and I was assigned to the Air Corps Supply. I had put in a request to go to radio school. Um, the first time around, they, they wouldn't send me. Um, I didn't understand why, because I had noticed that all of the you know, the, my, my comrades who had sort of graduated from their, from the, uh, from the training program, they had all been assigned to various jobs and they all became private first class. I remained about private. And so when my turn to go to radio school came about and I wasn't sent, I was kind of aggravated. And I ran into the Air Corps supply, into the, into the, um, Colonel's office that was way in the back who had charge of the entire facility there. And I bluntly asked him, why was I taken off the list to go to the radio school? He told me I was too important to the Air Corps supply. I was one of the few people that could do some clerical work with a typewriter and, and do the overshortened damages and that sort of, and I was very precision and very precise in what parts went to what supply depot for either repair or for junk. The former person who was a longtime corporal, he was unable to do that kind of work. So I did the work. Um, they, thought, they thought I was too important to the Air Force supply. So I said to the colonel, I said, if you think I was so important to the Air Force supply, why am I not a private first class? Why am I still a buck private? A buck private in those days was getting $21 a month. And we did our own laundry. The uh, private first class, I think he, he got a lot more. He was making, I think, $27 a month. So in those years, every dollar counted. And so that was one of my experiences at the Mitchell Field of, of Supply Depot. So what was the excuse for not uh, elevating your rank that he gave you? Well, he gave me no, he had no, actually, he had the control over where I was working, but my squadron commander 
had the control over whether I got a rank or not. And of course, there was a little bit of, well, I hate to say this, but there was a little bit of uh, prejudice involved. And so I was mm -hmm. sort of skipped over. I was in an old time outfit. Mm -hmm. Old timers that had been in for 10, 12 years and stuff like that, you know. The corporal, he'd been in five years before he made corporal. Mm -hmm. So that was why I didn't mm -hmm. get my... So then you were in supply. Where did you uh, go for your next assignment? My next assignment was to Scottfield, Illinois, to radio school. Uh, the corporal was supposed to go to radio school. He didn't want to go because he was told if he went to radio school, they were going to strip him of his stripes and he'd be a private. Uh, the reason given was that at a table of organization, they allowed only so many corporals, so many sergeants, and so forth and so on. So he didn't want to lose his stripes after waiting five years for them. So he said he wasn't going to go. So I said to him, would you mind if I take your place? And he said it was all right with him. <laughs> so I rushed up to the, to the first sergeant's office, and I went in on, and I said, you know, Corporal so-and-so said that he doesn't mind if I take his place going to radio school. Can I go? Well, he was kind of aggravated, and he said, well, I'll go and I'll see the captain, and I'll see what he says. So they went in, he went inside, he left the door open, and I could hear them discussing me, and the captain saying, and he's saying between the two of them, I think it'd be better if we got him out of this outfit. So he came out again and said, you know, you can go off to radio school. Well, I had to clear the base and go through all the procedures to get away. And I went to radio school. Uh, I had a friend of mine who was in the outfit. And uh, about four or five months after I was at radio school, the outfit packed up and went to Iceland. They opened up a supply depot in Iceland for the, I guess only for the Air Corps. They might have had, the might have been open for the base for, for soldiers also and in infantry. But um, they went to Iceland, and I thought how fortunate I was I didn't go to Iceland, which of course I was fortunate I didn't go. But Iceland is not what it sounds like. Iceland turns out to be one of the nicest places you could want to go to. They have thermal heat and they live a, a great life there. Greenland, on the other hand, is a place you don't want to go to because Greenland is terrible. It's just a big ice cap. <laughs> so uh, he wrote back saying where he'd gone and uh, he was happy to know that I had gotten the radio school. And so I was on detached service at radio school, supposedly that I would be returned to the outfit probably in Iceland. But then other things happened. Radio school at that time was a six month course. Three months of maintenance, radio maintenance, and three months of, of um, procedural um, tower work, you know, the, when you have the uh, directing aircraft in and out of the airports, weather information, all this sort of thing. And of course, um, code, Morse code, and you would also become a radio operator on a plane if you were adept enough at Morse code. Well, I went through the radio school pretty well. And the last, when I graduated from radio school, the top 10 in the class were asked if they'd want to go on a special secret mission. Um, it was going to be spectacular. You would enjoy it, and you wouldn't enjoy it, maybe, but you know, he gave no indication as what it was all about. Only that we would go out of the country and that we would be on a secret mission. No one would know that we'd left. Now they took the 10 top in our class who volunteered to go, and the top 10 in the class following my class of the top 10, that made 20 of us that had just come out of, let's say, radio school. Uh, they sent us on a mission to, to Canada, to an RAF school, which had a, which was secret in itself, and they had airborne radar. And they were going to teach the U.S. Uh, uh, enlisted men about Air Corps radar, air, air, airborne radar, 
And um, they had it. The Germans didn't know they had it. And of course, we didn't know we had it. The reason we got it was that at that period of time, we had been given England a lot of Lend-Lease uh, destroyers to protect their convoys going across the ocean. And this was one of their uh, ways that they felt they could help pay us back, was to give us this information, this secret information. Now, up there in Canada, where we went, which wasn't too far over the border, and I can't think of the name of the town right now, but um, we were joined by 20 old timers, old linemen, who knew what they were doing, sergeants and tech sergeants, uh, who were able to take care of aircraft maintenance for radios. And uh, when we were there, before we could know anything of what was going to happen, we had to take some very, very strict tests. Now, some of these tests were almost like semi-engineering tests. Of course, the young ones like myself that came out of the school, we knew a lot of theory. And we could pass the tests. But the old timers, unfortunately, a great many of them could not pass the tests. They knew how to fix radios, and they knew how to do the stuff better than we knew how to do it but they couldn't pass the theory. And there was a lot of theory involved with radar. So they were sent back to the States, and then we were told of what we were going to find out, what we are going to do. And that's where I got the radar. Now, I'm doing this interview for one main reason. <clears throat> I know that there were many radar men that came after me out of schools in the United States, and a lot of them think that they were the first ones in radar. I want everyone to know what was the real, true background of airborne radar in the United States Air Force. I was one of the very first. When I got out of the service, I was the only flying radar enlisted man in the Air Force at that time. The longest one, everyone else either went into the mechanical end of things on the ground or some of them maybe didn't, didn't survive. But I was the longest one when I was discharged out of the Air Force. And what year was that? That was in 1945. Mm -hmm. I was in for about five years, and I would say four out of the five years or thereabouts, maybe a little less, three and a half years or thereabouts, I was on flying status with, with airborne radar. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Now, you mentioned, uh, now I know you weren't there forever and ever. Where'd you go? Can you tell us how you used some of this? Tra special training. Yeah, the training. What did you do with it after you with got the, With the radar? You mean after I got out of the service? When I was in the service? Oh, well, when I was in, in your service. service. Oh, yeah. when and I was in the service, yes. <laughs> well, of course, radar is a, is a technical composition, I guess it, you would call it the, the one step below what we have in television today. You had a round tube. The British radar had two antenna arrays that were out of each side of the wing, hanging from each side of the wing, and they would develop a pulse, an electronic pulse, like a machine gun, a little packet of a pulse, then a space, then a packet of a pulse. But they go in millions of a second. The, the, the timing of it is such that the, tech, the technical aspects are such that the electronics, let me put it that way, are such that they pump a bullet worth of electronics out, electrons out, have a space and then pump another one out. They will go on a practically a straight line and if they strike an object, they will be reflected back in to your antenna. And that's where the space in the middle comes. It comes back in the same antenna, gets processed in the equipment that we have in the plane, and gets put upon a screen that shows the additional electron power that has come back at that spot on the screen. The screen is divided off with a, with a gauge that you can tell the mileage. We went from, let's say, five miles to 100 miles. We'd fly about 2,000, 3,000 feet off the water, and the pulse would go out, and we could see 
100 miles, and if there was a ship, something of metal especially, that it could reflect back off of, it would come back to us. In my experimentations, because we were a research and development outfit to begin with, we would fly off the coast of the United States, and we would go night and day, especially in the nighttime, because that was what we were using it for, we were going to use it for. We could pick up a 50-gallon drum 10 miles away. We could pick up fishes, porpoising in the water. Uh, you had to interpret what you were seeing on the screen to determine was it a something that was of a signal type of a, of a vessel of some sort, or was it just grass returning to your scope, mm -hmm. see? And that was really the essence of the radar part. Mm -hmm. The first um, radar, actually we went to the, we went to the, uh, to the school up at, um, in Canada, the RAF school, secret school, and the, what we learned, we were sworn to secrecy. We couldn't even tell the people on our plane what we're actually doing, and we had a, a 50 caliber, not a 50 caliber, well, you had a, the um, 45s, a pistol. We had a pistol that if ever anything would happen where the, the uh, equipment could be um, disclosed, we were to take that pistol and shoot up the, the equipment. They didn't want, there was a magnetron tube in there that was the secret of the whole thing, which you have in your, in your, uh, in your um, microwave ovens. You have microwave mm -hmm. uh, uh, tubes that, that heat the stuff electronically in your, in your microwave tube, in your microwave. But that was the heart of the, of the, uh, of the radar equipment. It would, that's what generated the electrons to be spewed out. Now, they didn't want that secret of that, of that tube divulged, especially to any enemy that might be in any place, and that you had to shoot up. You had to make sure you destroyed that. But before we had our radar equipped planes, we went to the ones who were in the radar end of things that came back from, from uh, Canada. We were split up in groups of two to different air bases all around the countryside because if anything happened in any, any place, they didn't want all of us to be uh, destroyed, you know. So um, we were split up. Now, I went with a young man whose name happened to be Catchell. My name was Katz. His name was Catchell. And we ended up from Canada. We were assigned to Philadelphia Airport. There was a a, um, a reserve place down there in, 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 on Federal Street, or what do you call the, an armory on Federal Street. And we got there the, the night before, th before New Year's. New Year's Eve, we arrived there in the nighttime with a little snow on us and a little dampness, and we walk into this captain's office, and we walk in and we salute, and we say, Privates Katz and Catchell, uh, you know, <laughs> coming to here, you know. And he looked up at us and he says, "Are you two for real?" <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't he couldn't believe that we had such similar names, that we the two of us were assigned to his outfit. See, of course he didn't know what we did anyway, but we were there. And the reason I know it was New Year's Eve was that next day was New Year's Day, and we were bumped in that armory on the top floor. And along Federal Street marched the, um, the Mummers in the Mummer Parade. Colorful, first time I ever saw them. Mm -hmm. Everybody who has a chance to see them should see them. They are just fantastic. Mm -hmm. They are these large marching groups, and they're all in, in the tremendous looking costumes, playing string instruments, and they march along, and it is just something to see. But anyway, um, we were there for about three or four weeks. We were at uh, we were there. In the meantime, Catchell got into the flying sergeant group and he left. 
So I was the only one there at the time when I went to the next stage. The next stage was MIT at, uh, in Boston. Uh, we were based out at the airport, at Logan Airport, and some of the professors, or some of the people who had developed the US version of airborne radar came down from MIT and, and taught us about what we should know about the, the newer version of radar that would be put in the planes. Now MIT is Massachusetts Institute, Institute of Technology. Technology. Yes, I have a little pin here. I can show you with a picture and all the other thing. Anyhow, um, uh, we stayed there for about three weeks, I guess it was. Was it three weeks? Was it? I think it was eight weeks, if I'm not mistaken. But the planes that, that we put the equipment into were B-18s. Now, a B-18 is a two-engine bomber, a peacetime two-engine bomber, not a 17, that's a four-engine, it's not a 24, which is four-engine. It was a B-18, very wide wingspan, very slow, and in the nose of the plane was where the antenna, which was a spinning type of antenna, in a plastic nose on the end of it, and there were five planes. Those five planes, when we learned what we were supposed to do with the equipment and all, we flew the five planes back to Langley Field, where, that, where we had our home base. That was our home base then. And then we were at Langley Field, and we flew out the coasts of, of, uh, of Virginia and down the Carolinas and northward up to the uh, upper Virginia areas and of course out to sea because we were looking for submarines. There were submarines off our coast at that time there. Um, incidentally, I know exactly where I was when Pearl Harbor was bombed. I was in Canada at that RAF base and we were watching as the Brits would get in their planes to fly back to England to to fly with their radar in England, and we were thinking to ourselves at the time, um, there they're going, but when Pearl Harbor came, then we heard it from the Canadians and the Brits that were at the RAF best base saying, well, Yank, how does it feel to be in it now? <laughs> you know? But uh, it was a, uh, we had a good time up there. I mean, we, we kidded between ourselves. They were, they were good people, good people. Mm -hmm. Now you, um, what did you, you said you ended up in Africa, didn't you? Oh yes, but before that, I ended up in the water. Okay. Um, with one of the B-18s. We went out one night, and we were hunting subs, and we're out flying back and forth, and our navigator in the nighttime, he was supposed to be shooting the stars and keeping an eye of where we were, and we finished our, our tour, whenever, our, our, our uh, patrol out there, and we had found nothing but odd and end items. And we started heading back, and the navigator said, he didn't know where he was. He comes up to me and says, gee, cats, he said, where are we? So I said, well, I don't know, I'll take a look, and I w watched for land. I said, the, the pilot turned the plane to go westward, because he knew he had to hit the continent, you know? And of course, you can see, the, a layout of the coastline with the radar set. See? So I told them where we were, and I gave them the directions, gave the pilot directions, which way to go toward Langley Field, and he's flying in, and he finally says to me, okay, catch, he says, you can take up your, you can, you can turn off your set now. And I turned off my equipment, let everything run down, and I'm sitting there quietly, and, um, he says, I've got, the, I've got the beacon, the Langley beacon, which is a radio beacon. And it goes like, dit da, da, dit, dit da, da, dit. And so he was following it on in, in the nighttime, on his uh, radio um, compass. And we're flying, and I'm flying, and from the distance I told him, we were from the coastline, where we should have been, it's going to take about 10 minutes to get there. Well, we're flying about 20 minutes or more, 
And I finally called the pilot and say, you know, did you did we get there yet? You know? He says, uh, I don't know. He says, I don't know. It's mighty strange. He says, and he, and he listens closely to his and to his radio uh, antenna, the the uh, compass, and he realizes that he is going out the other end of Langley Field. The radio compass takes you with like a da dit da dit, mm -hmm. and if you go through the zone zone of cone of silence that they have that comes up when you right over the right over the field, it changes. So that you know you're going the other way by going instead of dot it, dot it, dot it. See? He realized then that he was lost again because he, he'd been going beyond Langley Field. And meantime, we're starting to run out of fuel now, see? Mm -hmm. So we decide we're going to have to land someplace. And he flies down, comes down low, puts his landing lights on, and he sees a field that he thought he would land in. And the field was, was plowed and had furrows in it, he thought he'd land in the direction of the furrows so that we would not rip up so much as going across like a, like a, like a washboard, mm -hmm. see? And as he's coming down, he spots water a little bit further on, and he decides maybe he'd be better off landing in the water because it would be a little smoother than the, than the land thing. So he picks up his landing gear again, and he lands in the water right off the coast of Virginia, somewhere off the coast of Virginia. We didn't know where it was until afterwards. And it was dark at the time, and um, everybody started going for an exit. Well, the navigator, we had the, one of the, 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 the one of the enlisted men, or two, two enlisted men, ran out and jumped into the water feet first. And they ended up standing in waist deep water. See, it wasn't deep. The navigator runs past me, <laughs> runs up to the door, and he has a brand new pair of shoes in his hand. He says, What do I do with these shoes? What do I do with these shoes? And everybody says, Take them and shove them. <laughs> but get out of the way. We all want to get out of the plane. The two guys on the, in the water who's standing waist deep, they say, don't come in. <laughs> you know? But it's kind of dim. The, the dawn is just beginning to break. And they could just see them in the water there. And they say, don't come in. But he, has to, he just has to come into the water. So he, instead of jumping in feet force, he takes a swan dive right into the water and right into the muck at the bottom of the water that they, the other guys were standing, the other men were standing in. And his feet are kicking in the air. His shoeless feet are kicking in the air. And they had to pull him out or he would have drowned. <laughs> so then we all got on the wing of the plane and we sat there and waited. Well, along comes a, in the, in the, in the fog and the mist, along comes a, uh, a fellow in one of these flat bottom boats, big kind of a clumsy looking flat bottom boats. And he looks at us and he says, you know, he says, that's a land plane, isn't it? And we said, yes, it is. He says, it doesn't want land in the water, does it? <laughs> he says, no, it doesn't usually land in the water. He says, do you need any help? We said, no, we didn't think we needed any help because the radio operator had done some radio work when we found out that we weren't underwater, see. And he had gotten the base somehow, and they said they're going to send out planes looking for us. And uh, he says, you know, I'm a clam digger. He says, isn't that a terrible job? He says, and we said, no, it's not a terrible job. You know, we're happy to see us a, a landlubber, so to speak, you know. But anyway, the Navy and the Coast, the Coast Guard, I guess, was came out eventually at daybreak. We saw a plane, like B-17, was hunting for us at a Langley Field because a radar plane was down. And they found us, and then they told the Coast Guard where we were, and they came and picked us up and took us out. <clears throat> well, now I would think when you landed in that shallow a water, it would have been worse than in a deeper, but it wasn't. Uh, no in, the, in, in a sense, well, in a sense, it is worse because you hit, the, you hit the bottom, but if you're out in the ocean part where the waves are coming up, that's as bad as going mm -hmm. into, the, into, the, into the washboard, you know, mm -hmm. and that breaks your plane up because you you hit, you don't know if you're going to yeah. come over on your nose and break in two or what you're going to do when you, when you 
Well, did you all get nervous uh, worrying about? Well, I'm going to tell you, we were, we were scared. Uh, we we had emotions running when we were going down because uh, we were uncertain how we were going to mm -hmm. land and what was going to happen to us. And of course, we had our station to get to. You have certain mm -hmm. ways that you're supposed to present yourself when you're going to hit water and all, and back to bulkheads and things like that, you know. And it is quite a, uh, a disturbing thought. But, you know, when you're young, mm -hmm. you're adventurous and everything. And, that's, and I, I just loved flying, oh, so yeah. I continued to fly. Did they make any effort to recover the aircraft oh, equipment? Oh, yes. By all, they sure did. They sent out um, scows and things, you know, <laughs> under the auspices of the Coast Guard and the Navy to recover that plane, though they never used it again. They recovered everything in the plane, and they wouldn't, I wouldn't release it until a Navy officer came on board, I should say a Coast Guard officer came on board, and my pilot told me release it to him because I wasn't going to turn that unit over to anybody because yeah. that was my responsibility. Now when the pilot said release it to him, go ahead and release it. Okay, if you say mm -hmm. so, that's it. You know, mm -hmm. He's the captain of the plane, well, that sort of thing. And he's the yeah. big boss then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Were there any repercussions for the ill-fated landing? No, no, it's, you know, I guess uh, I'll tell you something. There are almost as many airmen killed in accidents, training accidents, not even seeing the enemy as there are seeing the enemy, you know? So, you know, of course, the, the only serious thing about this was that it was, there was radar on board the plane. Mm -hmm. the, the other reason was such an old airplane, they didn't, they the airplane had no value. Mm -hmm. Just the secret of the equipment mm -hmm. that was on it. Okay, from that point, uh, what happened for future training and future missions? Well, I'll say that uh, we continued flying up and down the coast. We went to we, we, we went to Palm Beach, West Palm Beach, Florida West, West Palm Beach. We went Florida Boca Raton for a while. Uh, we then held, heard of a scare down near the Keys, the Florida Keys, and we were based we went down, the five planes went down and flew off of the out of the Florida Keys on a on one island with one runway that went out over the seawall. And if you didn't get off the ground, if you weren't off the ground when you went over the seawall, you ended up in the, in the drink. And when you came in, you came in over the seawall. If you cleared it and landed on this, on this coral-like runway, fine, it was fine. You know. Nobody had any problems, actually, but it was an interesting way to take off and land when you saw it, you know. The other thing that was interesting also is that when we took off and when we landed in these old planes, we had depth charges on board. And they had a nose cones on them that made them look like a bomb, but they were actually a depth charge. They exploded by the depth in the water. We flew low. We flew about, oh, I'd say 1,000, 2,000 feet off the water in these B-18s. And because um, if you went too high, if you dropped them, if they didn't hit the water right, the depth charges, they could break apart and they'd be useless. But um, uh, we flew out of that base there, and uh, on our time off, we went to Key West, and we go down to beaches on Key West. But uh, we had our routines that we had to take our turns at flying out to do what we had to do out there. Now, you mentioned uh, you had a crash when you were taking oh, yes. off in uh, Morocco. Yes. Well, that going over was, there's so much. To talk about. I mean, if I if I would talk about, you know, I don't know how long that's going to last. But going over, if a person has nothing that he knows he's going to do in life, by all means, get in the air force. That's all I can tell. And try to get on a crew, because that's the best best kind of thing you can have. Um, we went over the southern route. Uh, we stopped at Brinkenfield in uh, in Puerto Rico. We got into the Guiana's, British Guiana, I believe it was. Um, well, I can't think of the name of the city down there. But a, a, uh, a boat had been torpedoed. Incidentally, at this point here, we were in B-24s. 
I went over in the B-24. I didn't go over to B-18. B-18s, they went by the board. We used them for training as long as we could. And then at Langley Field, we started seeing B-24s coming in that we never saw before in our life. Uh, to me, anyway, I had never seen a B-24 before. It came in fully equipped with all the equipment on board, with a crew, brand new crews out of school. The, the pilot and the co-pilot, I think, had about 50 hours of, of real flying time to their, to their name. They decided who would be the pilot, who would be the co-pilot by flipping a coin. They had a, a gunner that was just out of gunnery school. They had a radio guy that was just out of radio school. They had an assistant radio guy just out of radio school. Brand new crews. I would had quite a number of hours in the air flying with the radar, so I knew what I was doing. These people were all brand new, new people. Okay. They were forming a squadron to go overseas, going to go to England, say, with the, with the, with the U.S. type airborne radar. They wanted to see could it hold up under actual conditions, warfare conditions. The first squadron was formed, I thought I'd be one of the first ones on it, but the first squadron was formed, 12 aircraft, and they went. There was a dead time in between there, and I was doing what I was doing while I am training out with, with the B-18s and all, and I told the officer in charge of us down there at Langley Field, I said that if I wasn't going to go out on, on a crew, I'd rather go to o OCS. So he made arrangements for me to go to o OCS. About that time, 12 more B-24s come in. I said to him, you know, can I get out on one of these planes here? He said, yes. He said, uh, if you want to go, I'll, I'll sign you to one of the crews on here. But he said, I, got a, a, I had sent all my stuff home about my letters that I was going to go to OCS and all this kind of stuff. My mother and my father saw it, and they see that. And then all of a sudden they hear, I'm going to go on a crew to go abroad, you know. And they send a letter to to this captain in charge of our department. He says, you know, what am I going to tell your mother and father? They want, they want you to stay here. They don't want you to go abroad. They want you to go to OCS. I said, well, just, just tell them. I know if I went to OCS, I wouldn't fly, because I'm colorblind. I said, just tell them that for on circumstances beyond your control, that I was assigned a crew, <laughs> and I have to go on the crew. See? So he sent them a letter, and I have the letters. He said, that would change into between them. And um, so I got on a crew. We went to Southern Round. I went to Bergen Field, like I told you. I went to this place in uh, New Guinea, British Guiana. British Guinea. British Guiana. You know where this, where these uh, religious groups went? They, yes. went to the, they went to Dutch Guiana, and this was British Guiana. <clears throat> a supply ship had just been torpedoed recently in the harbor of, of this, um, oh, I can't think of the name of the town, of the city down there. And we were at the airport, in the, in the air base. And we lived in huts that were up on stilts. And the rains came and all that kind of thing was happening. Um, they went into the, the, the chef, the, 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 uh, the cooks would go into the jungle and they were shooting some monkeys and bringing back for me, see, because they needed food. At that base, I saw a twin-engine Mitchell bomber with the one propeller had been broken off. And the story I got was that that Mitchell bomber, who had been there for some time, waiting for parts and waiting for, for another pilot to take it out and take him back into the States, that had come in for a landing, and it lands on a tricycle landing gear, and it had bounced a little too low, and one of the props had hit the, hit the concrete pavement and broken off and flown through the side of the plane and cut the leg off of the pilot. The pilot had survived, evidently, because they were going to send everything back to the States if they got parts in to fix it up. But that's the story I got. It's a place that's in the middle of nowhere. See. We got in there. We got out of there. Each of our planes flew by itself. There were 12 planes in our squadron. Each one flew by himself. No one 
we didn't go like in a formation or anything like that. So if you got into trouble, you got into trouble. Now that probably happened to that twin engine plane. They probably had a squadron of some sort they were with and they were left behind I mean, as they went through. They landed and had their problem. The rest of them went where they're going to. From there we went to Brazil. We stopped at, uh, I guess it was Belém is north of Natal. And then down in Brazil is a big country. And that one country, the one part we stopped in, the first stop we made, which was in the north end of Brazil, I believe it was Belém, was like a like a uh, wild west country town. And uh, we stayed there about two days, something like that, and then we took off and left. But you could go into a bar down there, and it was just like you see in the movies in the 1800s, when you see the guys come in and put their foot on the thing and spit in the spittoon, and, and flat board um, 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 floors and, and, a, and a board uh, thing on the top, the uh, bar, you know. Rustic as could be. And then we went, and the reason I mention this is because we flew then from Brazil to some place that probably very few people even heard of, the Ascension Isle. Have you heard? Oh, you heard this. You, you probably might have. The Ascension Isle is like a little volcanic spit of rock up in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, the South Atlantic Ocean, with one runway on it, and you land on that runway. And it wasn't a tremendously long runway, but for B-24s, we could land on it, and B-17s could land on it also. Bombers could land on it. World War II bombers could land on it. I imagine these new bombers today could never land on it. But anyway, we were there, and those people there had the worst part of the whole war. They had to maintain the rock, the, the base there, for aircraft, aircraft going the southern route. They had to fly their supplies in, or they, if a ship came in with supplies, that was a hallelujah deal, you know. You had to have tickets to get a beer, a can of beer. There was nothing to do except to look at each other and try to fish if you wanted to fish, and the water was brackish, had that lava taste to it. We gave our tickets for beer, we gave it to the people there. Every night, someone committed suicide. Every night, somebody committed suicide. We were there, we heard one shot, and we found out the guy, the young man, whoever it was, had committed suicide. The boredom got to them. They had no place to go. A person who flew in a plane he, at some point, could take a flight back to Brazil or someplace where there was people, you know? But that was one of the poor situations. Mm -hmm. From there, we flew on to North Africa, not to North Africa, to, uh, to uh, the Gold Coast. I guess it's the Gold Coast. Accra, down in there. Beautiful area down there. I wonder sometimes why some big hotel chain doesn't build some resort hotels down there. They have a beach and blue water that's so clear and so beautiful, that's a place they should build something. From there we went up to a, a small country, uh, British Gambia I think it was. The most, uh, I, 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 my heart goes out to the, to the British, it really does. Um, they had ablutions, what they call ablutions not wash-ups or going to the bathroom, ablutions was the term there. And when you went to the bathroom there, when you had to go to sit on something, it was, it was like, a, like one of those coal buckets that you have coal in with a little plank on the top of it and a hole in it, and somewhere along the way it had to get emptied out. It was, it was a horrible place over there. Real native country, real native country. And then from there we went up to where we got finally to some civilization we got up to Marrakesh in uh, French wow. West Africa. Mm -hmm. French West Africa, um, the, the impression I had, we almost, we almost hit the Atlas Mountains. We were coming down from an altitude to land at Marrakesh. And we didn't know exactly where we were. And as we were making a circle, we were making a wide circle to go around the sea, we hit something that we would recognize down there. The, Co-pilot looks out the side of his window and he says, "You better tilt to the left." And the pilot tilts the 24 to the left and lifts the plane up. 
They're right there is one of the jutting ends of the Atlas Mountains right over there. So that was our excitement for that thing here. We landed in Marrakesh, and that was a nice city. I got in there. We were there for about a week because we needed a part or something to, to repair the plane. Something needed to be done. And while we were there, I got into the city of Marrakesh, and there's the native quarter and the regular quarter. First time I went in there, I got lost in the native quarter. Yeah. And I have a, a U.S. uniform on, <clears throat> and I'm walking along, and this whole area is filled with Arabs in their white things that come down to the ground, you know. And they're looking at me very skeptically, and I don't know where I'm going, but I'm keeping my head up, and I'm walking, and I'm walking as if I know what I'm doing, and I really don't know what I'm doing, you know. And along comes this French woman on a bicycle. And as she comes by me, she sees me, and she knows that I'm lost. See? So she goes on up ahead of me, and she rings her little bell on the bicycle, ding dong, ding dong, and she gets up, and the Arabs would open up for her and let her pass. They'd close in behind her, and then they'd open up for me to let me pass, you know. And uh, of course, they, I, I don't think they had anything vicious in mind, but uh, I didn't know what they, what they were thinking. I know what I was thinking. I was thinking, I want to get out of there, you know. So I followed this, the tingling bell until I got into the open area where the mid, more middle part of the town was that, that it was uh, more civilized. Let me put it that way where I could talk with some people at least, and then I got myself out and I got myself back to the truck where we went out to the base. But that was a uh, emotional sort of situation for me. From there we went up to the, to the rocket Gibraltar. So you know, we had, a, we had a tour of half the world. You know. That's why I say, join the Air Force and see the world. <laughs> Don't join the Navy to see the world, join the Air Force to see the world. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it was a real adventure. Went to Rocket Gibraltar, Gibraltians there. It's a little community. Um, British again, they ran it all. They, they were on the rock. The, um, the people on the rock were friendly. They were nice. The laborers came from Spain next door. They came on and they were so So poor, so uh, in need of something, of food or something, you know, that we would eat in the, in the British mess hall. We you went almost any time as airmen into the British mess hall. And it was not too clean because we found cockroaches in our coffee pots, or our teapots, I should say, our tea, our tea cups. But we, when we finished, like a, a piece of bread dipped in fish oil was a meal. And a cup of tea. That was a meal. That's all they had to eat there. The British. And we ate British food there. We would get whatever was left over. We'd get outside. There's a 50 gallon drum. We'd drop that into it, and there's a slop. That 50 gallon drum had pure slop in it. The Spanish people who worked on the, on the base there, pulling these little grass tops off of wine bottles and packing them to be sent back to Spain for the next bunch of bottled wine that came on somewhere onto the post, onto this British air base here. They would come up to that barrel, they'd put their arm down on the barrel and fish around down until they could catch a piece of bread that someone had left over and thrown into them. And we, didn't, we threw half our bread in there because we couldn't eat the fish oil in the bread. They'd fish that out and they would shake it off a little bit, and they would eat it and relish it like it was a box of Lofts candy or something like that. It was so pitiful to see this. My assistant engineer and I, while we were on the rock, decided we would climb up the hillside. We climbed up the hillside as far as you go, and then you get to a big fence up there, where beyond the fence, the British have their big naval guns that control the Straits of Gibraltar. We sat up there and we looked down and we saw a lot of scurrying going around on the base down below, on the air base down below. A plane was taking off. We understood after it was filled with Marines. It took off the ground, got out over the water, and went into the drink. They never found the plane, never found anything. It's so deep out there. There's nothing. Couldn't see anything. They couldn't find anything. Just an act, just a happening, an accident in the war, like I say, almost as many men died in 
training things and exercises as not seeing the enemy as seeing the enemy. Anyway, when we had decent weather, when we heard that there was decent weather in England and there was decent weather at the Rock to take off, we went to England and we went up to St. Evel in England, St. Ives, that's on the west coast of England. <clears throat> The British were very nice. I tell you that I have the greatest compassion for the British people. Of course, every GI that got there was helping them save, them, helping them save themselves. So they were all grateful to the United States. But I have to say that the British were very, very nice people that treat us nicely. And I have the greatest respect for the Salvation Army. Not too happy with the American Red Cross, but I have great feelings for the Salvation Army. Those British Salvation Army uh, volunteers were out at our air base every morning, every day, with donuts and coffee free. Have a donut, have a cup of coffee. Now the British didn't have much to spare. But they were there all the time, those volunteers of the Salvation Army, free. If we went into a Red Cross, if we went into a Red Cross place for a, for a dish of ice cream, which we thought was one number in Africa, say, we went in for a dish of ice cream and a robot, we had to pay for it. We didn't get it. I would have thought the American Red Cross would have surely have given us a little dish of ice cream. No, 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 we paid for the ice cream, paid for every little service we got there from the Red Cross. Okay, maybe it was nice that they at least gave us the facility or something that we'd get someplace to write a note home or something like that. But when I thought of the British and they had nothing and the Salvation Army gave us donuts and coffee. Anyway, we flew out of England and a lot of things happened in England not so much to me, because I flew my tours when I had to fly my missions, but there were a lot of our crews that died in England. We had some pretty rough times. One crew with, with a pilot who I was so friendly of and knew so well when I was back in the States. I liked to fly with him as his radar man. He was an old-time captain, an old-time officer in the, in the Air Force. They came in, his crew came in one day off a flight, and there are cliffs nearby, and you're supposed to get over the cliff and come in for a landing. He didn't quite make the cliffs, cracked into the cliffs, everybody was killed. Anyway, did I use my whole time up on that one? No. Um, did you get over, did you have any missions over Europe? Uh, no, well, not over Europe, but in the Bay of Biscay, in to where they had, uh, Submarines that had German aircraft and uh, some of the things that we went through at that time, at that point. We, we did, uh, when I say we, I mean our two squadrons, there were two of us. Generally a wing, I guess, has, or a group has more than two squadrons, but because of our nature, what we were doing, there was only two squadrons there. In the end, we lost 50% of our personnel. 50% of the men that went over in the two squadrons never came back. They had replacements come in. We had 24 planes came back again, but all half of them were all new crews. That's what happened with, to all of us between England and, and uh, North Africa. Now, both of us have a similar experience. We both served in Port Leone, Morocco. Yes. What are your, your reflections on duty there? I'm going to tell you something, except for that well, of course, except for some of the accidents I saw that happened that killed our personnel, that I, I'm an adventure, I was an, I still an adventurous kind of guy, but I was a real young buck, an adventurous kind of guy. I loved adventure, and I lived for flying. I wanted to be a a fighter pilot, I guess most guys do, you know. But that's what I want. But it was out of the question because I, I was colorblind. Mm -hmm. And I made two attempts to get the cadets. Both times, 
they caught my color blindness and sent me back home again. You know? But uh, one time before I even went overseas, before I even went to radar school, I tried to get any cadets and they found that color blindness said you can't go, you can't go to cadets, blah, 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 blah. That, that was the end of it. Then when I came back, I was a tech sergeant, I was, you know, uh, uh, overseas, come back from overseas, and, and so they tried to do the best thing for me. I want to go to cadets? Sure. Can you meet the physical? Yep. Did you do this thing? Everything. I got out of Langley Field with this, passed the colorblind test because they had the Asia Harry test, which is little triangles. I dated the girl who had charge of the, of the, um, of the colorblind things, and I would look there and we would talk, and she wasn't telling me what the thing was, other than that, she was telling me where the things were, but I didn't ask her, and she didn't think that she was telling me something, but on the bottom of each of these little round things with the, that had these little um, angles in there, little triangles in there to make the red and the green and the whatever colors they have in there, there's a little number, like a plate number, see, very, very small. Well, my sharp eyes in those days, I could see the plate number. So I memorized the plate number and what was supposed to be in the plate number, see? So when I had to take the physical at Langley Field, this was now after I had come back from overseas, so they were more inclined to go along with me on things. I took my physical, took whatever other examination I had to take, and when I took the colorblind test, I looked at that number and I knew it was in the box, or what was in that circle, there were round things. So I and about two other young men who were with it, had been overseas and back, went to cadet training down at Keesler Field in Biloxi, Mississippi. Well, all the new young recruits come in down there to get that training, and they have to march up and down the roadways. So you see them, on one, two, three, four, what are you yelling for, all that kind of stuff, you know? <laughs> of course, we didn't have to do any of this because we had come back from overseas. We had already seen the, the works of things. So we went into town, and we'd enjoy ourselves in town a little bit and do, do nice things down there. Then came the physical exam to go on to our next stage, which was going to be pre-flight training, which was in North Carolina someplace, from Biloxi, Mississippi to North Carolina. We go through our physicals, we go through whatever we have to do, and they come to me, and I get up to a colorblind test. And I figured, well, I'm going to get by this thing. See, I can see signals, I can see reds, I can see blues, I can, I can tell your, your thing is yellow. You're sure? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I know it's not yellow, you know. I can tell you have a yellow shirt. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I can tell the colors, but when they get these little things together, I just can't make them out. So anyway, I figure I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go into flight training, <clears throat> free flight training. What do they have? They have the, the um, American Union test or some, some I can't think of the name of the test now. It's a different test. These are different figures, different numbers, different everything in there, see? And I'm taking a look at these things. And I can't see them, see? Well, they got a captain in, they get a lieutenant in, they get a, 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 a sergeant in, they got everybody up to the main medical officer in the place, all of them trying to get me through. Just, don't you see it going like this? Don't you see it going? Don't you see the number there? Like, trying in every way to get me through. They wanted to get me through. Yeah. I couldn't do it though. Mm. So they sent me back to Langley Field again huh. as a radar uh, uh, instructor. But that's another another whole section of this of this world in itself again. So I don't know. And unfortunately we don't have time to well, hear all that. Then you're not going to be able to hear the crash and, then, uh, and everything else. It's, then when you got out you went to college? Yeah, that's right. The service yeah. and did when you do service? something yeah. related to your military training or not? No. Do you, have you flown a lot in your uh, years since you left the service? Uh, not as much as I would like, mm -hmm. but um, I I enjoy flying like in uh, yeah. in commercial airliners, mm -hmm. you know. And I started taking flying lessons on the outside. Mm -hmm. uh, I got diabetes at that point, and so the flight surgeon says, if I can, um, if I can control my diabetes without taking pills, I could go on, but I have to take pills, so yeah. I'm going with that. 
But oh. um, I've been in businesses all my life, in mm -hmm. various businesses. Okay. I've had well, thank you for serving our country. Well, that's quite all right. I, I, I have to say that I feel almost guilty because the uh, because I enjoyed what I did, mm -hmm. and I had my difficult times. But everybody has a difficult. But like I said at the beginning, everybody had it worse than everybody else had, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. why probably a lot of the people are reluctant to to talk mm -hmm. about their their times. Okay.